Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 184 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck. And if you have a staff of two or more, you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast.gmail.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about his article, Adapting Wendler's 531 to a wider audience. Also, culture lessons at NBSC. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Aaron McGurr from Perform Better joins us to talk about the current sale and a new product called the Battle Bars. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Rachel Cosgrove is on to talk about social media guidelines and being professional. For the Functional Movement System segment, Brett Jones is on to talk about my favorite exercise, the Get Up. Jim Kilbasso is on to talk about a short segment on his topic, creating dynamic acceleration with athletes that he's going to be doing at the Complete Speed and Power Summit coming up soon in Indianapolis. The Art of Coaching with Exos will no longer be on the show. They've decided to kind of go in a different direction, but I do want to thank them. It's been a great partnership over the uh, probably about eight years now. But uh, funny enough, today we have, for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach, I have Nick Winkleman on, and although Nick is no longer with Exos, he's on to talk about his new job with Irish Rugby, his chapter in the book Sports Injury Prevention and Rehab, uh, that was on kind of assessments and getting athletes uh, to return to play. So we talked to him about that. Maximal strength, maximal power, and some great coaching info from his upcoming Functional Training Summit lecture. That and much more coming up from Coach Winkleman in a little while. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Anthony. How are you? My, you know, I need a, somebody. I got to write down a new response. I uh, maybe it's still t- indicates that I'm doing great. Because I would answer you. If anybody listens to this podcast, like he's gonna say he's doing great, Anthony. How are you? Just maybe but, some. Maybe get a thesaurus, like wonderful, fantastic. Yeah. Just add in some new words. Yeah. <laughs> some SAT words. Michaela's got to be taking the SATs soon, so yeah. maybe stupendous. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> coach. Speaking of stupendous, um, we got a big response to, not really on the forum, but on uh, when I sent the newsletter out, a lot of people interested in adapting when there's 531 to a wider audience. Can you give us an overview of 531 for anybody that doesn't know about it and, uh, and kind of what, you know, that, that obstacle that you kind of found and, and said, I need, to, I need to do something for a wider audience? Yeah, well, there's, uh, there's, I think, two problems within Wendler's 5 through run. And it is interesting because you realize that there are certain things that kind of hit the nerve button in terms of CrossFit-related posts. Um, I think a post that hits on this sort of, you know, powerlifting max strength kind of stuff, those are the things that always really get people's juices flowing a little bit. And um, so Wendler's 5 through run for people who don't know, it's basically a system – where on a week-by-week basis, you're dealing with a different percentage of your max. Like, let's just say it's the first week is 60% for five, 70% for five, and then 80% for five plus. And five plus meaning you do as many reps as you can. The next week, you do the same thing with three reps. The third week, you do one rep. There's a couple of problems that you run into there. The one most obvious problem to me is the one and three rep thing. Because obviously, there's Tim Wendler is a power lifter, and right? obviously very good powerlifter or a good powerlifting coach. But um, when you start talking about dealing with with athletes, with kids, with adults, I'm not a fan, obviously, of the three and the one. So if you say we're going to do the five but not the three and the one, it kind of takes away a little bit from the idea of that type of program. So one of the things that I looked at was, gee, could we not do this with where we raise the number of reps? And so we basically went to 864 and followed the exact same principle 
and simply adjusted the percentages. So if, if five was going to be done at 80, then our eight was going to be done at something like 72. I forget what it was, but um, something along that line. We just really adjusted the math. But the other thing that we did in Wendler's 531, one of the things that he said was take 90% of your max and then take percentages of that. And that's just one of those, I'm a, I guess I'm a stickler for silly mathematical things because if I want 90% of my max and take 80% of that, that's 72% of my max because 8 times 9 is 72. So I looked at it and said, why not just take 72% of your max? And I understand from his standpoint, it's probably because if you did that, people would think you were training too light. And because, again, he's dealing with a different crowd than we're dealing with. He's dealing with power lifters. And I think what he's probably trying to say, in all honesty, and he might, you know, if you had him on the show, he might say something to that effect is maybe some of these guys don't have as accurate of a max as they think. And maybe that that max wasn't quite as clean as it should have been in terms of from a technical standpoint. And by adjusting that down a little bit, we get more realistic weights. Those might all be accurate statements. But in our situation, if we simply said, okay, I want to do eight at 72, then do eight at 72. The only biggest difference for us is that we don't have accurate maxes. So you almost have to, in some ways, you're picking stuff out of the air, at least for the first week. You're picking stuff out of the air and you're saying, okay, here's the number that we're going to use. The good thing is in that, you know, whether it's eight plus, five plus, whatever it is, that third set, is going to allow you to adjust everything because you just can simply look at that and say, all right, if, if they get significantly more than what they're supposed to, then we know that the number they use is too light. So it's still easy. And the cool thing about one of those things is it is, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It's, uh, it, it makes, um, and it does a lot of what I like to do in terms of that kiss principle. Let's just keep it simple. So I just, you know, Sean had talked about it, and I thought oh, I wrote an article about this a while ago, and I realized that we never published it, so there it was. And I think we're going to actually use it in the summer, probably. We might use it as kind of a phase one thing for our athletes this summer. So, have you? But you've used it, and it's you've had some good results. Yeah, we have used it in the past, and yeah, it does. I mean, it's, it's you know, I think with everything, the one thing I've learned is nothing works. There's nothing magical. I wish there was, you know, the number of different routines and set and rep schemes and all these things that we've tried. I so wish I had actually stumbled on something that really was magical. I'm like, Oh my God, this, like you get super strong when you do this. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it just may work better than some other things, particularly in the short term in terms of just getting people like, I think that, um, you know, we might mark it as like an AMRAP set, as many reps as possible. That idea with people saying, hey, third set, do as many as you can get, definitely gives you, one, there's a different motivational uh, task for the person. We're not saying do five. We're not saying do eight. We're saying do as many reps as you can possibly do. Yeah. And I think that changes things. And then there is just some of that... Um, you know, kind of fundamental, you know, and if you think, I think Alan Cosgrove wrote an article about it years ago where they did a little bit more of this kind of in-phase variability. We would tend to be, you know, we might do something like like a Wendler's 531 or an 864, and I might do that over nine weeks where we did three weeks of eights, three weeks of sixes, three weeks of fours, whereas theirs is more, Eight for the first week, six for the second week, four for the third week. So I think some of it too is it's just I got this. There's innumerable ways. Excuse the cat here. Yep. And, and this is one pretty good one. All right, um, Coach. We had an interesting discussion on the strengthcoach.com forum, and that was about the staggered stance RDL. And and he had asked, would this be a good option as a regression for clients who struggle with balance? 
for the single leg RDL. And basically what it looked like was he just had took, you know, for a right leg, he just moved his left leg back a little bit and uh, and did the RDL in kind of a staggered stance and it looked like he had most of the weight on the right foot. Um, for me, you know, at first glance, it looks, it looks I, you know, I it, it, it scared me. The title scared me, staggered stance RDL. I, was, I didn't understand right away, so it was a good thing that I looked. But I was, you know... I don't want to see balance, the balance on, um, on uh, equal on both legs on, on something like that. Cause I don't, I, I never liked any of that staggered stand stuff, but this just was kind of putting the back foot down to kind of help somebody with balance. Um, there was mixed reviews. You said you liked it, but um, you're still you use it, but you're still not a big fan of it. Um, ben Bruno had an interesting comment. He said the bilateral deficit often doesn't apply to single leg RDLs, and if it does, not nearly to the degree it does with knee dominant single leg exercises like our, um, rear foot elevated split squats and lunges. Um, he as well liked, uh, you know, agreed with you on this whole thing. Kind of expand on the staggered stance RDL topic. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. Like, since I really don't like it, I'm like you. I don't like the the staggered. I either want to be split stance or not split stance. I want to be balancing or not balancing. You know, it's sort of like I, I don't know, training wheels on a bike or something. I don't really know. <laughs> I'm not I'm not a huge fan. Kevin had a version. I don't know if we put it on the forum or not, or he did a video the week of it where we were using a valve slide, kind of sliding back on a box. I can't remember if we pictured that. But I like that a little bit better for someone that struggles with balance because they still have to be on one foot. So if you can imagine, your back foot is on a pile box that has a valve slide on top of it. And it obviously only works with the smooth top pile boxes. But as you move into that single leg deadlift position, you extend that back leg so at, with the slider. I have to try to remember to send a video in and pull up one of Kevin's clips so you can see it. Mike, and, um, it's actually it's actually think, we posted it this week from uh, Ken Whittier posted it. It was the single oh, leg. Okay. We, it's Perfect. it's up there, yeah. Yeah, so I like that much better because part of the thing that I don't like is when people say, "Well, people struggle and they don't have good balance." I'm like, "Well, that's freaking why they're doing it." You know what I mean? If if you want to develop balance, like make them develop balance. Yeah. You know, do the call reaches, do those. You know, don't, and then do your bilateral. Like, don't like literally. You know, Greg Rose always talks about half-assing things. You know, it's like don't half-ass it. Don't sort of, you know, give them a glute and a half to use. Give them one or two, and and let them start to develop some balance. So it's um, yeah. uh, I just think that it's. And it's interesting, but the one thing I know I love with with Abe is I you know he's he's like perfect because he throws it out there all the time. He's not the least bit intimidated. He's the guy I talk about all the time in terms of he's a rugby coach in Sri Lanka. He's dying to learn, and he's not afraid of what anybody's going to say. He's not afraid to look stupid. He consistently throws stuff out there and creates a really good learning environment for everybody else. I wish you, I you know, honestly, I wish you had five more of them. Yeah, he does ask a lot of questions. You're right, and and yeah. you know they all do. You're right; they create a lot of good discussion. Um, yeah, and some of them, even some that you think initially are absurd, create really good discussions. Yeah, because you realize that sometimes just realizing, wow, somebody actually thinks that makes you go back and realize, gee, we haven't covered as much ground as I thought we have, and it makes you go back and hit some basic stuff that maybe. You hadn't hit before, so it's. Uh, I think it's really beneficial in a bunch of ways. Coach, <laughs> you had posted a link about culture. Matt Duffy, uh, a baseball player, wrote a uh, a uh, an article on the Players Tribune called "The New Kid." And um, it kind of reminded me, believe it or not, like he was just talking about like the welcome that he got in the locker room, getting called up. Nobody knew him. Um, there's certainly ways that we can apply that into our gyms. Um, you had you had just posted. Um, we just posted on the site as well, and you posted on your blog about your book notes for you win in the locker room first. A lot of talk about legacy and culture, and you know, in sports, 
Can you just kind of go over some of the things that you try to do? Because we haven't talked about, and we just talked about this with your meeting. Sometimes we, for, we you know, we've talked about so many topics, but we, you know, we probably haven't talked about it in a while about some of these business topics. But what are some things that you do to kind of, you know, that you learn that you kind of like when you when you read a legacy or you win in the locker room first or the new kid uh, that you kind of try to take to uh, Mike Boyle's strength and conditioning and apply there. Well, I think it goes back to that CNT idea. Certified nice person. Start there. When you're trying to create a culture, you can't create a good culture with dead people. You can't. And I mean that from an employee standpoint. If you have a standpoint, if you've got people who are not inherently friendly and who do not want to help people, you're going to have trouble creating a good culture. We talked about it yesterday. We have a couple of guys in our mentorship we kind of a small group in. And a lot of what we talked about yesterday was culture. You know, if you come into a gym and the guys are in there in skin tight tank tops and, you know, everybody's looking like, you know, Joe Jack steroid guy, that's your culture, right? You walk in and you look and you see some guy in there and he's got, you know, his headphones on and lifting glove on and a big leather belt and he's slamming out curls and throwing the bar on the floor. That's your culture. And, you know, you, you kind of have the kind of fitness has that joke, like whatever the no lunk zone or whatever it is. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to create a culture. They're trying to change the culture of the gym. How many people do you know? Because you, you and I are old enough to remember people say, oh, you know, I could never go into the gym because yeah. I don't fit in there. Yeah. I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get the respect that I deserve. You know, it goes on and on and on and on and on when you think about this. But that's culture creation. You have to create a culture. And I think it's really hard to do in our business when you're thinking, we want to have sports performance. We want to have young kids. We want to have their mothers. We want to have the geriatric crowd if they want to be there. And we've got to create a culture that creates a level of comfort for all of those people. And I said, and sometimes for us, that's, that's meant that maybe we've had to give up a little bit on like the kind of the meathead football side in terms of not not encouraging that type of person to be our client. You know, like I have some pro football guys who are awesome. I have two offensive tackles this year who are both 6'6", 300 pounds, and are, they're real gentlemen. And I think you know, when you think of the word gentleman, you think gentleman. And they are. They're not when it comes to playing football. But, you know, they're not in there, like, you know, throwing dumbbells on the floor and spitting on the floor and screaming and yelling. And and I think, you know, sometimes our industry can be overrun by morons. And then we as owners, as business people, whatever, let these morons destroy our culture and make people uncomfortable, make people not want to be there. So I think you have to start with some really basic stuff, like, we have simple stuff, simple rules. We don't want, you know, it's, we don't want knee reps. We don't want gloves. We don't want headbands or walkmans or, you know, headphones. So I want air amp again, dating myself. Personal headsets. There we go. What's that? <laughs> um, you know, we don't want tank tops on guys. There's, and why? Because we're trying to eliminate that meathead factor in our facility. Because all of those things I would look at and think, those are all really big meathead signs. We don't want them. And that's not saying I don't want, you know, people, you don't want athletes, you don't want strong people. I'm like, oh, no, no, I want athletes. I want strong people. I just don't want your typical kind of big stereotypical weightlifter guy, you know, who's in there clapping his hands and throwing the chalk dust around. And when he's done with his dumbbells, he throws them on the ground and yells. I'm like, I used to yell like that. I said that. I used to see all my you guys all the time. Somebody throws dumbbells on the ground, and I'm like, if you're strong enough to pick them up, you're strong enough to put them down. Put them down. No need to throw them on the floor. You know, it's like kids that look at you like, you know, kind of like, oh, I always do that in my gym at home. It's like, I don't give a shit what you do in your gym at home. Don't throw my dumbbells on the floor. <laughs> and, and gradually over time, we created that kind of culture where, again, our kids were polite and respectful in the weight room. And, 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 and we've talked about this music. What kind of music are you going to play? You know, you want to play offensive rap music where people are, you know, overtly sexual or racist. Okay. That's your culture. That's your environment. You know, if people walk in there and they hear words that they wouldn't want to hear, do they want to come back? 
No. And I think there's so many people who don't. There are other people who say, oh, it doesn't matter. Well, if you think it doesn't matter, you're dumb. Because it matters to somebody. I mean, I can remember even, um, you know, when I worked for the Red Sox, we had a couple guys who were really religious. And they would come up to the weight room to get out of the clubhouse sometimes just because of the music. They're like, I can't listen to that stuff anymore. Because, you know, somebody's down there playing Drake or Two Chains or somebody, and they're talking about doing horrible things to women and using language that these guys don't use. And you realize, you know, even in a professional athlete environment, you can have people that are made uncomfortable, um, you know, by something as simple as music. So I think you could go on forever. And that's where Legacy does a really good job, I think, of hitting our culture. And obviously that's why I like that little Players Tribune piece that the guy wrote on. I don't even remember his name, to be honest, but I thought this is really good in terms of it. Uh, it hits that, that culture point hard. Like, you know, hey, Everybody who said hi to me, everybody who's happy to see me, you know, now you go back to like Alan Cosgrove's idea of that third place and cheers and Starbucks and you want to go where everybody knows your name. There are all these things to to think about that maybe seem a bit cliche, but I don't think they are. I agree. I agree. Uh, a great book for that is uh is delivering happiness from Tony Shea, the uh the CEO from Zappos. Uh they talk about really, really deep dive into culture and how he came up with his 10 core values, et cetera. So that's good stuff. I just think that you don't want the tank tops because you don't want any of us Italians in there. That's what it is, man. You Irish kids, that's true. The I mean, Irish absolutely. kids don't like us. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't say, you know, I didn't use the, uh, the white beer as a term. So, tank top, so that's there's, I think there's a couple other ones that we, we know. We, Liz Elspeth would be all over me because <laughs> she really liked ex-wife on the body tempering. Uh, thing. So that, I'm sure she'd like white beer almost as much. Yeah, the, the white, the body tempering one is, is is uh for next episode <laughs> we'll have to get into that that was, <laughs> that's that might be a whole episode but anyway coach thanks so much for coming on and we'll talk to you next time all right thanks all right now it's time for the ask the equipment experts with perform better and i'm here with aaron mcgur aaron thanks for coming on thanks for having me all right well uh, as always what do we got for the sale uh, the sale is actually the same as last time, so it is still at the spend more, save more. So depending on how much you spend, you will save more. Um, you'll save 10% off of orders $50 to $99, 15% from $100 orders to $149, and 20% off of your order $150 or more. So a uh, good time to get some discounts. We still have our same closeouts. I know I mentioned that last time as well, so we have some Airx mats, plyo boxes, banana steps, and um, we also have battling ropes. So if anyone's looking for a big one, we have a one foot, or I'm sorry, hundred foot, two inch rope, and that's almost seventy percent off, which is crazy. Um, and then we also have some battle ropes. We have the pairs of sixteen and a half feet, and we have those in both one and a half inch and two inch thicknesses. So uh, definitely take a look at the closeouts because we're adding stuff, uh, more and more stuff each day. Very cool on the battle ropes. And um, actually, speaking of the battle ropes, you have a new product called the Battle Bar. It's not only good for battle ropes, but um, tell us about these. look pretty interesting. They look a little scary, but they look uh, interesting. <laughs> they are interesting. Um, the one thing we just did, we just added a new video to the Battle Bar page. So if you go onto our website and see that, um, it's kind of hard to tell what it does just from a picture and a description, but when you check out the videos that are on there, it really shows what the bars are capable of. Uh, what it is, it's a steel bar, and it has an opening on the one end. So you can actually self-loop a training rope or a battle rope into the end um, and just do different exercises with it that really adds a new twist onto core training. So like I said, you just self-loop a training rope in, and the one thing I like about it, is that you can do so many different sport-specific movements. So um, if you have a training rope attached to the bar, you can do side-to-side -side rotations, similar to if you were kayaking. Um, you can mimic rowing if you do single-sided swings. Um, we've had people do slap shot movements, lacrosse movements. I mean, you can step and throw to mimic uh, throwing a football. You can do batter swing. So obviously with the training rope attached onto that, it does add kind of a new dimension to the training instead of just doing the basic um, 
battle ropes with your hands. So that part's pretty cool because it does make it a little bit more interesting, a little more sports specific if you're into that. Um, and we've also had people attach on the double one chains or um, like nylon straps to it and use it more like for modified farmer's carries or overhead presses. Um, so it's kind of like a smaller barbell with the attachments on there. But um, it's different, like I said, but it's so cool to actually have something attached to a training rope. We use them here all the time, and that's the biggest issue is when we do our circuits and when we do our training here. Um, it's always nice to add something new in there. So uh, we've been doing that lately, and it's just been it's been a lot more interesting. But it took some time for me to get used to the double one. Um, but I do like it. Like I said, adds a new dimension. Your core and your abs and everything around that area will be hurting probably the next day. So <laughs> we'll get you fired up. But um, I like it. It's a and, new product, like you said, and, and it's different. Any idea what the weight is on that? Uh, yeah. So the single bar, um, it's 37 inches long, and it weighs right around four pounds. And then we have the double bar, which just has two openings on both sides. So you can attach a rope on both sides. Um, and that one weighs about eight pounds, and it's a little longer. It's about 50 inches long. All right, very cool. That's uh, definitely an interesting product, and uh, not a bad uh, combo with the uh, with some of the ropes uh, in the clearance. So, very cool, Lee. Well, thanks for coming on today, talking about the uh, the current sale and the battle bars. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Awesome. Thanks, Ant. Hello, welcome to the functional movement system segment. My name is Brett Jones. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the get-up. Uh, it's one of my <laughs> favorite exercises. Uh, Gray and I filmed um, Kettlebells from the Ground Up, Kayla Stenos, uh, years ago. I think that's coming up on, uh, we're, we're close to 10 years, uh, at least eight. Could be upwards of 10 years since that was released. I, I'm really not sure. Um, we went an inch wide, a mile deep, two DVDs, 36-page manual. Uh, there was so much information. We did a second DVD, uh, Kettlebells from the Ground Up 2, uh, where we really looked at using the get-up uh, to help with some movement patterns and uh, really dove even deeper into what's possible uh, within the get-up. Uh, why should we use the get-up? What, what, what are the benefits? What are we looking for? I personally think it's one of the best mobility, stability, multi-planar movements that you can perform. It loads the system from multiple angles, planes, positions, all with great postural alignment. And you have this alignment because you're aligning the center of mass of this weight efficiently through the body. My mindset when I'm doing a get-up is never that my hand or my shoulder is holding the kettlebell. Yes, my hand is holding the kettlebell. But my mindset is that I'm aligning that weight through me efficiently to the ground. I want to align my structure so that that weight efficiently goes through my body and ends up in the ground. It's not held by my shoulder. It's not held by my whatever piece or part. I've aligned my structure so that that weight efficiently goes through my body. And then I'm moving through these multiple angles, planes, and positions, constantly adjusting the center of mass through my body to the ground as I go through all of these different positions. Uh, there's really a lot of unique things going on. Uh, there's a ton of things that you can do during a getup. There's the high bridge at the elbow. There's the high bridge at the hand. There's uh, actually pressing at all of the steps of the getup. There's so many different ways to use this getup, uh, and it just has so many different uh, planes, angles, and positions with this alignment. It's a really unique exercise. It has tremendous benefit. Uh, Brett Contreras did some EMG work, found 100% or more maximum voluntary contraction of all of the uh, so-called abdominal muscles uh, during the getup. So we're getting really good activation. There's tons of shoulder stability and mobility happening as we go through all of these angles, planes, and positions of the getup. It is a coordinated movement of the upper and lower through, mul through these multiple planes, coordinating these uh, transitions in posture. Uh, as we go through this. So efficiently transitioning, there's just a ton, there's so much going on. The greatest fear of an aging population is falling. Their second greatest fear is not being able to get up off the ground. So the get up 
is training for life beyond the the weight room. Uh, this is efficiently moving yourself from the ground to standing to back down, builds strength, builds stability, builds mobility. Um, it is a tremendous uh, exercise. It's a great way to get strong. Don't get lost in the minutia. I just uh, published an article on, on uh, Strong First uh, talking about the three pillars of uh, progression, uh, variety, and precision. Don't get lost so much in the precision that you forget that this is a tremendous way to get strong. Learn to efficiently coordinate moving from the ground to standing and back again while learning alignment, stability, control, smooth transitions between postures, hitting all of those angles, planes, and positions, aligning that center of mass efficiently through your body so it's held by the ground. This exercise is scalable to the individual, from Grandma Betty to elite athlete. Use the pieces or parts of the getup that you need for the person that you're working with. If it's just getting to the elbow, I personally think 70 to 75% of the benefit of the getup is in, in getting to the elbow well. If it's just getting to the elbow, uh, maintaining shoulder position on the arm holding the kettlebell, maintaining shoulder position on the elbow, uh, shoulder that's on the ground, then just use that piece of the puzzle. You'll get people who can't kneel because they have trouble. Don't worry about it. Do get-ups to tall, the tall sit, bridge at the elbow or the hand, and go back down. Uh, use the pieces of the get-up that you need for the individual that you're working on. Remember this is scalable. It's not an all-or-nothing proposition. Use the pieces that you need. I'm a big fan of the get-up. It's one of the staples of my training and staples of all the people that I work with. Remember, tremendous loading of the system for multiple angles, planes, and positions with great alignment, efficiently moving that weight through the body, learning how to get up and get down and get up. Old Chinese saying, fall down seven, get up eight. Um, we want to keep that in mind. Uh, the get up tremendous exercise. Thank you for joining me for this functional movement system segment and have fun out there. Hi, welcome to the Complete Speed and Power Summit segment. This is Jim Kilbasso, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about the topic that I'm going to be presenting at or on at the summit. Um, I'm going to be talking about how to create dynamic acceleration with your athletes. So there's a lot more to it, obviously, than this, but if you break down speed and acceleration into its most basic components, you essentially have to apply a large amount of force into the ground that's number one. Number two, apply it as fast as possible. And number three, apply it in the right direction. Those three things kind of make up speed development and put it all, uh, and break it down into an, in a nutshell. Now, several studies over the past few years have shown very definitively that speed is less determined by the amount of force that's put into the ground than it is in the direction of the force application. These studies have shown that the direction of the force application is the single biggest determinant to speed um, that they have been able to found. They also found that elite sprinters, they do apply a little bit more force into the ground compared to normal people, but they run a lot faster. They apply about 30% more force than normal people, but they run 80% faster. What that means is they are applying it differently, not more, but differently than other people. Now, if we as performance coaches are truly going to improve the performance of the athletes that we're working with, we need to teach them how to apply force in the ground, not just put more force into the ground. I think that most of us are um, we, we're real good at applying more force, but we need to really focus on teaching how to apply the force. And that is essentially what I'm going to be talking about at the summit. We're going to break down exactly how I teach um, these concepts to the athletes I work with in very easy to understand ways so that you can start applying it immediately. Um, I hope that this tip helped a little bit. Uh, for more information, and to get really deep into this topic and to hang out with me, come to the Complete Speed and Power Summit. It's going to be in Bloomington, Indiana at Force Fitness on May 21st and May 22nd. 
To get more information, go to www.speedandpowersummit.com. Thanks. Hey everyone, it's Rachel Cosgrove with resultsfitnessuniversity.com. I have an important topic to cover today, and this is something that's really confusing right now with social media, with you know how much do we share, how much do we not share. Um, you know, I know a lot of us are marketing our businesses online, and absolutely you should be marketing your business online because it's a huge opportunity to take advantage of getting in front of your audience, uh, sharing what your business does, sharing you know how you can help them, and uh, and if you're not currently doing something online, then you should. So you know whether it's Facebook or it's Instagram or um, wherever you're putting your efforts, I know for us, our target market are on Facebook. And so we do put a lot of our energy into, you know, really how can we um, put the right message in front of that target market while they're scrolling their Facebook feed. And one thing I want to bring to your attention, we have a core value that is be professional. And I think, you know, as fitness experts and as, um, you know, in the fitness industry, this can be difficult because what we do is so personal. It's so personal. And, you know, we really are connected personally to what we do. So how do you find that boundary? How do you find that line? And I just want to bring it to your attention as you are putting up, you know, stuff on Facebook, as you are creating that Facebook or social media presence, that online presence, keep that be professional idea in your mind, keep that in your mind and start to think about what you're posting. I would encourage you every time you put a post up or every time, you know, you're putting out a message, Number one, know what message you want to say, know what you want to put out there and make sure you have a consistent message and that you're speaking to the right person. Um, You know, that if you are trying to attract new clients, that you're not speaking to other trainers. Uh, You know, I've seen people putting up ads that, you know, they're sharing how um, how they have a, a, you know, a 34 foot rig or a 55 foot rig and monkey bars. And that's not going to attract the the client who is intimidated by the gym, who is scared to death. So, you know, make sure that anything you put up, you are writing it to that person you're trying to attract. And then really think about it. Every time you put up a post, ask yourself, will this make them know, like, and trust me? Because that's really the goal with marketing. The goal with marketing is to get people to, to know you, get them to like you, and then trust you to be able to take that next step to do business with you and help have you change their life. So, um, for instance, and this is really what I'm getting to, is I think, you know, for a lot of us, as we are on social media, as we are sharing some of our you know, ideas and our opinions, uh, we don't necessarily want to share any opinions that might, you know, really um, keep people from doing business with us. And what I'm saying is be professional. Uh, Don't give your opinions on politics, on religion, on anything that might be controversial, that might make people upset, that might make them, you know, basically not want to do business with you. There's no reason it's not going to help you to help them um, by you putting your personal opinions up. So just start to figure out, you know, where your boundaries are. Um, definitely it's okay to share some of your personal life. Uh, if, you, if you're if you on my Facebook page and you're on our social media, um, you know, if you are one of my friends, you'll definitely see that I do share some personal stuff. But the reason I do that, and every time I do do that, I always have in my mind that filter of, is this professional? Is this, this is going to my clients. This is not not something I'm putting up so so my friends can see. I'm not going to, you know, share everything about my personal life. Um, and, and I might put up a personal post, but it's really so that, you know, they can know, like, and trust me, you know, so that they know I'm a person, they know that I have, you know, that I'm, that I'm real and that they can trust me. And that's important. You know, that's important for people to, to be able to, connect with you as a person. And I think personal branding is so huge right now. People want to connect with people uh, versus business branding. And so you do really want to start to create that personal brand, but just really start to think through as you are putting your message out there and you are, you know, posting, uh, you know, ways that you're going to attract these clients to come in and work with you that you are putting up, you know, that every single time, just ask yourself, will this make my target market know, like, and trust me and eventually do business with me. And if the answer is yes, you know, then go ahead and and post away. Um, but definitely have a strategy with that and, and just start to think that through because the boundaries can get really blurred. I know. And, uh, you know, I know it's gotten really confusing because we're so transparent now. Um, so just start to keep that in mind. I see a lot of, you know, fitness coaches posting and uh, putting stuff up that, you know, may end up costing them business and, you know, really uh, in the long run and keeping them from helping more people. So, you know, our mission is to change the way fitness is done. I appreciate you listening in 
And uh, just remember to be professional, no matter where you are, whether you're on social media, whether you're, you're out in public, whatever you're doing in your business, always be professional and always keep that in the back of your head. So um, that way you can attract the right people to, to help change their life. So thanks so much for tuning in. Again, this is Rachel Cosgrove at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Check it out to see about all of our upcoming events. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach, and I have on an old, old friend of the podcast and myself, Nick Winkleman. Nick, how you doing? Fantastic. Hopefully I'm not getting that old. <laughs> no, there you go. Well, you know, I mean, we've been doing this, you know, the podcast is going on nine or 10 years now. We're in our, in our ninth, we're going to be starting our 10th in November, and, and I know, you know, you and I have been kind of friends for a, a that whole time and kind of going over, we were just talking about the art, how we started the art of coaching and um, was really a vehicle for, in my eyes for you, you know, you were trying to get your, your name out there more, even more than you were doing. And, and something that I felt like, you know, we, we, we were talking about you know, what wasn't really out there, what people really weren't, what we weren't getting taught in a lot of these things. And uh, obviously you've come a long way with that and uh, really educated thousands and thousands of coaches now on uh, on the art of coaching so um but yeah it's been uh you know let's just start out you you have a new job so i just want to talk about that you're not with exos <laughs> anymore tell us what you're doing yeah as of gosh as of april 1st i was officially uh, accepted the position of head of athletic performance and science for irish rugby so you know, the, the role basically allows me to do a lot of the similar things that I did at, at Exos, but now in the context of high performance sport. So, you know, for me, this, this type of position is one that I, I really have, have always dreamed of in that it allows me to continue to work with amazing coaches. So I get to work with our three primary national team coaches, our four provincial heads of athletic performance. So just for those that don't understand, basically the way it works is we have four professional rugby teams in Ireland and they play within the context of what's called the Guinness Pro 12, which includes obviously eight other professional teams across various countries in Europe. And those that operate at least in the Pro 12 as they say in the top of the table, so the top six, they then get to compete at another level of competition called the, the Europeans or the European Championship, which basically is teams across all the various leagues uh, in professional rugby across across Europe. So those four teams actually wrap up under the, the national team, under Irish rugby. So it's a little bit of a different structure than those that would be used to with at least American football. So I have the liberty of not only supporting all of our strength conditioning coaches for the national team divisions across men's and women's 15s and 7s. Those are the two different versions of the game, uh, but also those four provinces, not only their pro teams, but also supporting down to what we call the academy and the sub academy. So the ability to still bring forth uh, coach education is a massive part of my role. At the same time, you know, I'm kind of everyone's assistant coach. So I have the, the opportunity to go in and work with our various teams, especially at the national level and support. Uh, all the while, I get to really push forward amazing strategic projects from, you know, coaching to data and data centralization and, and really starting to work towards identifying, you know, the, the Irish way to strength and conditioning. So at the end of the day, I'm, I'm humbled and honored because there's so many amazing people already on the ground here. And I just have the, the opportunity to come in, work with them, support the, the great things they're already doing, and hopefully just start to, to build some systems that allow us to take all the goodness and scale it across all corners of Irish rugby and just elevate every level of the sport. That that's awesome. That sounds like I mean I you know for people that don't know and congratulations by the way. Um, Thank you. You you, um, you also uh, uh, got your doctorate, right? Uh, so <laughs> that <laughs> yes during that whole time. So it's got to be nice because I saw it in April. You were jumping around here in the states, 
and going and visiting uh, different facilities and, and taking a couple, probably a couple workshops. Um, that's got to kind of feel a little refreshing too, is to kind of be on the other end of the learning perspective too. I mean, you've been teaching a lot. That's where, you know, you and I first met was at Exos for the, when it was still athletes performance for the mentorship. So you've been yeah. really involved, heavily involved in teaching. Um, so it's got to be nice to be able to kind of take a breath and go travel and start to visit a little, you know, some other systems and uh, et cetera. How was that in April? Oh, that was, I mean, that, that was phenomenal. One, I got kind of indoctrinated into rugby by going to our our women's sevens tournament in Atlanta. And that was just, if you've never watched rugby sevens, it is an amazing fast version of the sport. It's a good starter version of the sport. If you've never watched any rugby and it's, it's actually uh, now it's, it's an Olympic sport. It's going to be uh, in, in, in Rio. So that was a phenomenal kickoff to the trip and really getting to spend time with all these amazing people that I'll be working with. But yeah, being able to go, you know, visit, uh, you know, taking my, my team basically to visit an NBA team, going to the, to the Hawks and then going to, you know, see Joe Ken at Carolina and then heading up to go see my friend Brian Miller at Navy and just kind of getting those three aspects. You're right. You know, Anthony, I haven't been able to do that in a formal way, but to be on the receiving end and, and being able to start to pressure test all the things that I've learned over the years uh, against what I got to see in just those, those short brief trips was, was amazing. And the fact of the matter is I get to do that here every time I go visit one of our training facilities. I mean, again, these coaches that we have on the ground are phenomenal and, and really the, the demands of this job will allow me selfishly to build more professional development for all of our coaches, myself including, included, which a, a lot of the time is going to be bringing over great people and great presenters. So our, our network that you and I know very well, Rena, are going to be definitely getting phone calls from me to come over to Ireland. And so nice. be on the lookout. Nice. Awesome. Um, Nick, let's, let's change it over to um, a chapter you wrote in Sports Injury Prevention and Rehabilitation. I had David Joyce on uh, a little while back uh, to, to kind of talk about the book and his chapter. And, and you, your, your chapter is assessing athletic qualities. But just so everybody knows, this is a return to play kind of book and chapter. Uh, obviously, sports injury prevention and rehabilitation. Uh, your your chapter on assessing athletic qualities. Uh, you were talking about. Let's just. I'm just going to read a uh, kind of an in, part of the intro and I wanted you to comment on this and, and kind of for, talk about it more. The inadequacy in, inadequacies of our return to play criteria have challenged us to reevaluate the way we assess athletic qualities. A shift from the reductionist point of view to an integrated systems approach to assessment is warranted. An integrated systems approach looks at phenomena from a multifaceted standpoint and examines the interrelationship of variables across various conditions. So talk to us about some of those inadequacies that you felt like were in the return to play criteria and, uh, and the direction that you'd like to see it go. Rena, we might need a translator for that line. I can't even believe I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I read it back. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, I guess a lot, a lot of technical words in there. Uh, you know, so I think what it comes down to it, when I was – when I sat down to write the chapter, you know, David had asked me to write it knowing that I obviously had a lot of experience with the NFL Combine and, you know, that – the nature of it is that's one big profile – that the NFL uses in part to make their decisions. So when I started to look at, you know, what we were, were lacking, part of it was in reflecting on what I felt the NFL maybe was lacking through the NFL combine. So when we started to look at that, it, oftentimes what we see is there were just qualities, you know, literal physical qualities that were not being addressed. And oftentimes a lot of those qualities might be things that are difficult to measure quantitatively. Now, while the chapter doesn't get into it, I know I allude to it in a number of areas, such as qualities like uh, behavior, motivation, uh, communication, resilience. Now we hear Angela Duckworth talking about things like grit or Carol Dweck talking about attributes of mindset and being process oriented. So, you know, at a, at a, at a broad view, I felt that those more subjective qualities were not, were not being addressed. And 
in part, one of the reasons I felt that those were so important is oftentimes when I was working with athletes preparing to go to the NFL Combine, it were, it were those features around their behavior, their motivation, how they conducted themselves as a person inside of the player, inside of the professional, how they de- dealt with adversity, if they had any injury in their past or, or injury during a given process, how they bounced back. I saw those factors being so critical. And I would say that, that broadly, a lot of the energy behind that long sentence was around those variables that oftentimes are much more difficult to directly measure. And I think now we have some inventories, especially around grit and resilience and motivation that can start to give us some insights. But oftentimes those insights do emerge more so through good conversation and relationship building. Um, On the physical side, some of the things that really have been missing, in my opinion, were as follows. We see oftentimes a lack of assessment of vertical and horizontal force production from the standpoint of a counter movement jump and then a broad jump. Within those, though, and I discussed this in the chapter, the need to really start looking at symmetry of force production. And again, you know, Mike Boyle's been talking about this forever. Oftentimes when we're producing force and we're producing athletic movements, we're on one leg at a time. So in that chapter, again, I start to discuss the importance and some of the insights assessing unilateral vertical force production through various hopping and unilateral horizontal force production through various versions, if you would, of a single leg type broad jump, as well as within those understanding that a non-counter movement jump versus a counter movement jump versus a depth jump, they're really giving us insights about different neuromuscular characteristics, whereby if we look at a non-counter movement and a counter movement, and Dr. Anthony Blazovich talks about this, both of those movements take a fairly long period of time in terms of how long you have to produce the force to then generate the jump, and likely are more similar than different. And you really don't get a good assessment of stretch shortening cycle or thus the elasticity of the system until you go into some type of depth jump or drop jump, which technically have different definitions. Either way, both of them are producing a faster stretch shortening cycle than we would classically see in a counter movement. And uh, Schmidt Bleicher talks about that as fast and a slow stretch shortening. From there, then in the weight room, and I talk about this, you know, the assessment of strength and power. I think generally as a field, we do that fairly well. But again, a gap that I at least alluded to has been a gap that I believe has been filled by a lot of the good work of people like Dan Baker out of Australia, where they look at power profiling, where they look at how you express power under low loads, under moderate loads, and then under high loads to really start to fill in the gaps in terms of where should we be spending our time in the weight room? Should you continue to lift heavy? Or maybe for this phase, would it make sense to do more high-speed work against a lighter load, even maybe emphasizing plyometrics? That then moves on to you know some of the gaps that I would have identified in the chapter around sprinting. Oftentimes, we see maybe a 10 meter or a 10 yard sprint and a 40 yard sprint, not necessarily getting all of the necessary splits that really give you a proper speed profile. You know, technically, if you look at sprinting, at least in my opinion, I'm interested in what happens in the first two to three steps. So you could theoretically make an argument for for looking at two and a half to five meters, then 10 meters gives you an understanding of initial acceleration, 20 meters, secondary acceleration, and then 20 meters to 40, really looking at max velocity. And each of those areas have slightly different strength qualities associated with them, slightly different movement qualities associated with them, and definitely how they build together tells the story of the actual final time. Uh, Similarly, when we talk about our agility. You know, the work of Warren Young and Jeremy Shepard have clearly stated that agility is a term that is not well understood. Funny enough, if you pump agility into Google and you look at the images, 
I'd say 99 out of 100 of those images are pictures of dogs on an agility course. So even as a field, we don't clearly understand what agility means. And they do a great job in, in one of their review papers, God, it might almost be a decade ago, clearly defining it as change of direction versus reactive agility. So we talk about the importance potentially of not only looking at a 5105 or, or a 505, specifically left and right cutting, but potentially looking at a reactive agility test or the rat test, whether it be using a light-based reaction, reacting to another human, which might not be as reliable, or actually reacting to pre-recorded video, which might not be financially doable. So in either way, it's important to understand that there are now assessments where we can look at change of direction under a stimulus, under a decision in certain instances that starts to tell us how they might translate that movement skill to the context of actually playing a sport. And, and that's important because the research that I would talk about relative to reactive agility starts to point to a very simple fact that those athletes that are graded higher Right? If we were looking at professional versus amateurs, not, we don't always see the amateurs being slower in change of direction or slower in sprinting. But oftentimes when they look at the amateur versus the pro in a reactive agility context, the pro is better at making decisions or reacting to some stimulus, which obviously plays to the fact that they are in a professional sport operating at a higher level of skill. So really what I propose is we've likely been missing some of the important attributes of agility, specifically reactive agility, that tell a more sports-specific story. And then finally, I think it's all the bits that, that definitely the, the listeners to this podcast would appreciate, making sure you have some qualitative assessment or some way with which you go about looking at movement quality and making sure that when you assess things like capacity or energy systems, that you are assessing them in a way that is contextually specific to your sport. And then inevitably what that profile does is it gives us a good understanding of your underpinning strength and power characteristics, hopefully left and right, vertical and horizontal. That, if you would, defines the engine, defines the raw material we're working with. From there, we have a transparent view of linear and multi-directional speed, multi being broken up into that change of direction and reactive agility. That now gives us an insight into how you drive the car. And then from there, looking at your energy system side of it. So what kind of is your fuel utilization? What kind of race do you need to run? And do you have the repeatability and the endurance to handle it? And then finally, taking a look under the hood qualitatively with something like an FMS, you know, how are the shocks? How are the brakes? Do you have these minimal physical competencies around mobility and stability to successfully use all the strength, power, and driving skills that you have as an athlete. Wrap all that together and support it with the behavioral, the motivational, the resilience, the mindset pieces. Now I think you have a very comprehensive profile. Might not always be operationally effective to collect all of that at once, but I believe at least what we just described there does cover all the major attributes that make up athleticism. And we simply need to contextualize those measures to the type of sport, type of athlete in specific position that we're interested in. And that is a very long-winded way at reviewing the chapter and really defining what I meant by that statement. Talking about just those different qualities, um, and before I go into, I wanted to ask you about maximal strength and maximal power, but I want to stay on the, the kind of return to play idea because that's what your chapter was about. You, you said in the end, and this really seems to be a paradigm shift further, it may be recommended that rather than an athlete achieving equal to or greater than 90% of performance compared to the pre-injury athletic profile, the athlete must achieve 100 plus percent of the pre-injury athletic profile as original deficits may have been an underpinning determinant of the injury in the first place. Um, yep. Do we feel like, I mean, that that seems to be, it seems like when you just read that, it, that would be hard to do. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, there's some subtleties in that statement, and that is that do you feel that the profile they presented with pre-injury had any evidence, right, that could suggest why the injury occurred in the first place? 
So if you have an individual that presented with uh, an asymmetry in change of direction or an asymmetry in their unilateral horizontal hop or that their strength norms in the weight room, whether it be upper body or lower body, were below what you've identified for that position, that team is considered an average or a norm. So to qualify that statement, I believe you would only want to get above 100% or above what was their normal when you've identified in hindsight that their normal was inadequate or in fact what their normal may have been an underpinning factor to the injury that you have observed. Conversely, if you have an athlete that, let's say it was a contact injury to the knee, so it's not due to non-contact nature, and this person was a workout warrior, fantastic in practice, and one of the leaders on your field, on your team, then you may find that, gosh, they only need to get back to 80%, because they're 100, their norm was so high that we can't expect them or wait for them to get all the way back to that before we start reintegrating them back into to practice and play. All right, and I'm being very general here. We would need to cover a specific example to nail down the details. But I think the importance, the reason I was compelled to make that statement is if you are doing an effective job at profiling your athletes, that profile really starts to become important because inevitably, if you have enough input data through the profile and enough output data from the standpoint of performance metrics on the field and injury data, then you can start making some relationships there. And maybe what you do find is a given athlete's profile, within it there is evidence that inevitably would be suggestive of a certain type of injury in their case, and thus in return to play, maybe not for all the variables, but for at least certain variables, you might in fact want to get them above a certain level or reduce a given asymmetry beyond what was prior to the injury, consider their normal, and help them achieve a new normal. Interesting. Makes complete sense. It really does. Um, Nick, let's talk a little bit, and it doesn't have to be about return to play specifically anymore, um, but uh, just some stuff you said in the, in you know, you mentioned in the chapter, and that's one of the import, the importance of maximal strength. And I think this has been kind of a controversial topic lately with people yeah. talking about maybe uh, some of the um, – velocity-based training, um, and, you know, how strong do we need to be? It's a question I think we're always going to ask. Yeah. Um, talk to us about that, what your feelings are on maximal strength and how strong we need to be, uh, m- you know, moving forward with, with an athlete. So I want to attack this a couple different ways. You know, I remember listening, uh, listening to, to Charles Poliquin or, or reading an article that he had written, and he was discussing – relative maximums, right? But he was discussing them in the context of the sport. So he had certain numbers for what the front squat relative to body weight needs to be for a downhill skier, for example, or what it might need to be for a certain position in ice hockey. Now, guess what, Rena? They were never the same. They were never the same value. And even coming here, in sitting down with our four provinces, they have their own insights through their data. They have basically found that, hey, if an athlete can lift X percent or X multiple of their body weight, if we're specifically talking lower body, for example, that is kind of a metric they know that they're strong enough. Anything above that is gravy, but they at least want to get to a certain level. And to be fair, sometimes in a program that might start out as arbitrary, but inevitably as as data reveals itself, you can start to say, wow, when we're playing at our top, when we're winning, when we're healthy, we might be averaging, you know, 1.8, two times body weight on a squat for a complete arbitrary example. So I, I think the only way you get to a definitive, you need to lift X multiple or X percentage is simply through using your, your practice, right, as the evidence and starting to look at the numbers and looking at how, as strength changes, how is that influencing other attributes of the program from injuries, from speed, from the way they play the game. Some might be things you can quantify, some might be things that you can't. So I, I will say that in terms of, because you know, everyone's always looking for a fixed number, what's the magic bullet around multiple of body weight? 
And at the end of the day, I think it's always going to be contextualized to the world that you are working in. Does a soccer player need to lift the same multiple of their body weight as someone that's the front guy in the scrum taking up, you know, almost a, a, a ton of freaking load through the total uh, scrum in rugby? No, they, they probably don't have the same strength requirements. So I do think that that is, that is key. In terms of how to, how to figure out how strong is strong enough, and now this emerging role of velocity-based training, and by no means am I an expert in, in VBT, I would look to people like Brian Mann, a gentleman out here, Eamon Flanagan, they're doing a lot more research and practical work in that space. And I would encourage those interested in using Tendo units and Gym Aware for velocity-based training to seek out resources by those two individuals. But I will say this, you know, when we look at the early work of Prue Cormie, Dr. Prue Cormie, who operates out of uh, Edith Cowan University, at least I believe she still does. She did some early work working, looking at uh, youth athletes, right? And I, I can't recall exactly what age, but definitely non, non-professional athletes and probably in a high school age or a secondary school age here in Europe. In looking at those athletes, they took two groups and just I'm being very general here in what she did. But one group worked kind of within the power domain. So all of the loads would have been at those theoretical loads that optimize maximal power. So definitely not working on, on those heavy 85 to 90% loads. Conversely, the other group was working with very heavy loads, strength-based work, you know, probably everything averaging well above 85% of 1RM. So you have a group that really emphasized, let's call it velocity, and another group that really emphasized force production and overall load. Okay? And what they found at the end of the study was quite interesting with this group was in terms of improvements in things like jumping and sprinting and change of direction, field-based metrics, they all improved quite equally. Okay? The biggest difference, though, Anthony, was this. The group that lifted heavy also got stronger, and the group that just did power-based work didn't. So in that example, the power-based work definitely helped with velocity-based qualities, but those that did strength got a, a two-for-one. So I absolutely believe that, that force and thus strength is the material with which power and speed is built on, right? So when we look at that, I think that's a critical thing that cannot be overlooked. And it, it wouldn't be sensible for me to overemphasize light loads or keeping the loads light to get at X velocity if there hasn't been a good level of base strength developed first. And I think the key is this, as long as your strength is continually increasing and that increase in strength is also translating to an increase in the expression of power, which is exactly what Prue Cormie found, then you, you probably are in the right to continue to emphasize strength as a major quality. Once you no longer see that your emphasis on lifting heavier, heavier, and heavier is increasing power, and thus it's no longer making as strong of a contribution to the expression of, let's say, velocity, whether it be velocity-based training as measured by a tendo or a vertical jump or the speed with which you can cover 10 meters. So I think if you are collecting data on the weight room and you're collecting data on the outcome measures of jumping, sprinting, and agility, you're going to see, especially with younger ages, that there's going to be a very nice transfer between them getting stronger and then getting faster and jumping higher. But inevitably, over time, you're not going to see that, that one-to-one, and I'm just being general here, impact be as robust as when they're younger. And we all know this just through common sense and strength and condition. So as their strength starts to peak out and they're lifting 1.8, two times body weight in a squat, then in, Dan Baker clearly suggests this in his research, a distinct emphasis on lighter loads and power-based work becomes more and more important. So I would say over time, the longer an athlete trains, likely the more important it becomes to augment all your strength work with more distinct velocity-based work, whether it's in the context of your, your normal lifts using a tendo 
or gym awareness feedback or through the emphasis of Olympic lifting. Now, I will say this all the while, even though strength is critical on the outset of any good program, you need to start building the framework for, for technique around plyometrics, around Olympic lifting. Because oftentimes, once you get to an elite professional level, if that athlete doesn't have the background of jumping, sprinting, agility, Olympic lifting, your velocity-based mediums, it becomes very difficult to develop the quality while trying to develop the underpinning technical attributes. And thus, oftentimes, you're spending so much time developing the technique, you're not getting the physiological change that you want, which is why I cannot stress enough with youth athletes, as you start developing strength, build the technical framework for plyos, Olympic lifting, and movement skills so that you can clearly emphasize them later on as their strength starts to level off in terms of its its need to get higher. And, and that would be some of my major suggestions. And you see that again with the likes of, of Dan Baker's work. He clearly shows that as you get stronger, its direct contribution to power might not be the same as when you are initially weaker, and thus an emphasis on power and velocity becomes more and more important the stronger you get. So hopefully that provides at least some uh, philosophical and, and focused insights into the, the chapter section and my general insights around that question. Absolutely. And I think it, there, there, there is a little bit of confusion just with like when you were talking about maximal power is commonly achieved between 40 and 60 percent of one RM. Yes. But yeah. it should be noted that loads as low as 10 percent of one RM have been shown to elicit maximal power in untrained exactly. individuals. So I guess, you know, like you said, starting them out with all that stuff, you're still going to elicit that maximal power. So it's really important to make sure they're doing that. Yeah, if you're clearly focused on developing strength, and I would say if you have access to a Tendo unit and you have access to a gym aware and you can simply get the, the average or the peak velocities on the bar, whatever metric you're interested in assessing as your ongoing metric, there's no harm in doing that even when you're lifting strength loads because we know that an intention to move quickly likely has – you know, an important attribute in helping power, especially when you're lifting heavy loads. So the question still becomes, is it the intention you put behind the movement of the bar or is it the bar speed itself? And to be fair, I'm not up to date probably in the last five years on the research that has examined that. But from an attentional focus perspective, a coaching science perspective, I know that our attention has a lot to do with how our body allocates resources. And thus, if I can use the velocity as a trigger to help keep them focused, to help keep their attention narrow and get greater expression, greater output, greater acceleration and intention on the bar, I believe that that is going to lead to a better outcome. So it doesn't mean you can't measure velocity. It simply means should you live in the world of 40 to 60 percent in an attempt to maximize power and the kid's 16 picking up a bar for the first time? No, that can be part of the program, but they need to get strong. Strength is going to be the basis of every physical quality, and then we have to get more specific as they spend more time in that strength realm. Awesome. Great stuff. I'll remind everybody that's uh, from the chapter, uh, David Joyce's book, Sports, Injury Prevention, and Rehabilitation. Nick, we're going to shift gears a little bit like a 70s rock band who, you know, when people <laughs> when people go to see the 70s rock band, they, they want to hear the hits. And, and I think some of the people, they want to hear, they want to hear Nick Winkleman in coaching. So um, let's, just, <laughs> um, let's talk about... Um, Sorry, I just came back recently from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame where Chicago and, you know, uh, uh, you know, a couple other uh, older, old Deep Purple, you know, everybody wants to hear the smoke on the water. So um, I had to throw that in there. Um, Nick, let's go. Um, uh, your, your, your Perform Better talk this year is going to be um, uh, learning that sticks, how analogies shape understanding. Give us a nice overview of, uh, of what this is going to be about. So, you know, Chris Poyer has seen this presentation, I think, one time, and I got his feedback. And so far, you know, at least in his words, this is one of his favorites because, again, we're continuing to go down the rabbit hole in looking at coaching, but specifically through the lens of, of communication and how really our words definitively influence the movements that we see in our athletes. And 
you know, as I started to first looking at internal versus external focus, that was, that was the conversation, right? Should I give internal cues about the body or external cues about the outcome around the movements the body's trying to achieve? And, you know, that story, I think we've clearly shown that when you're teaching multi-joint movements, you really should spend as much time using cues that elicit an external focus rather than an internal focus. And I, I think that's more than fair to say at this point. But that still leaves us with this immensely broad category of, of really a you know external focus and all the different types of cues that can be brought up within it. And I've said many times that even within the category of external cues, not all cues are created equal. And, and any coach out there can empathize and understand and reflect on that point. You can give an external cue, but if it's not attached to a prioritized error, if it's not delivered with language that is relevant, that is interesting, that is poignant, then it might be equally as ineffective as an internal cue. So it's not enough just to say, okay, I'm using external cues. I'm the best coach in the world. No, you have to start looking deeper. So I did look one level deeper. And again, I presented on this whereby we talked about external cues having an anatomy. And that anatomy that I've kind of described as the three Ds of distance, direction, and description, whereby a cue can encourage a focus literally on a certain distance in space. So for example, if we were teaching sprinting, I could tell someone to focus on driving off the line as explosively as possible, and we might call that a close cue. Versus I might say, I want you to focus on sprinting towards the wall in front of you, and we could call that a far cue. Similarly with a broad jump, I could say, jump as far from the line as possible, versus I could put a line out in front of them and tell them to try to jump past the line in front of you. Again, we have something close versus something far. And what we have, what the research at least has shown in, in discrete skills like jumping is giving a farther external focus is better than giving a close one. So we, we start to see then that there's a mediator to the language that we use. Similarly, when we talk about direction, I could tell someone to go towards something or equally away from something for the same exact task. Now, there's no research on that, but I guarantee if you use what I call a toward cue, like sprint towards an opponent, sprint towards the wall, sprint toward the cone versus sprint away from opponent, away from the line, right? Uh, away from the bullet belt, if we were using that kind of a method those don't always elicit the same response in athletes. And if you ask an athlete, would you rather go towards something or away from something, you're gonna get different answers. So that's an area that I'm looking to actually do some research on, but I know right now it's a variable. Your cue can elicit toward versus away, up versus down. Think about the, how that influences it. And then the final one is the descriptor. And the descriptor, at least on how I'm defining it, either can come in the form of an action verb, so focus on exploding off the ground, where exploding off would kind of be your, your, your focus. It, it calibrates the intensity. It calibrates the intention versus if I said push off versus explode off, they give very different feelings. So how we utilize action verbs has a lot to do with the feeling the cue imparts on the body. And thus from a sensory perspective, how we can utilize that cue to influence the movement. But there's this, there's this interesting category of, of information, if you would, that comes in the context of what we can refer to globally as analogies. And under analogies, you would have metaphors and similes and puns and all these different language vehicles, if you would. But when we specifically look at analogies and metaphors, right, we, we're calling something, you know, we're describing something unfamiliar in terms of something familiar to create the bridge, to create understanding. And I think with coaches, we constantly hear coaches saying, it's kind of like this, or have you ever experienced that? Or have you ever been here when this happened? And we're always trying to create these bridges using experiences that an athlete or a client has had in the past to inform a novel or a new experience they're trying to have in the present. And thus we utilize analogies and metaphors all the time. In fact, in the in the presentation, excuse me, I talk about this, this fact that comes from the book, I is Another, where apparently research has shown that we give upwards of you know, six metaphors, five to six metaphors a minute. 
if not more. And in fact, in the presentation, I have the audience read a couple passages that show upwards of, of six to seven metaphors in just what would be 30 seconds of reading. So in looking at that, we're utilizing language all the time. And I've, if we were to backtrack and look at just this conversation alone, I've probably given hundreds of metaphors and analogies if we were being detailed. You know, on a good day, I might say, hey, I'm on cloud nine. It doesn't literally mean I'm on cloud nine, but you know I'm happy. If I, I say, gosh, you know, I'm just down in the dumps. Again, I'm not sitting in a dumpster like Wreck-It Ralph, right? For those that haven't seen the movie, it's one of the best movies ever. But, you know, if I'm down in the dumps, I'm not, I'm not having a good day. I'm not, fe- I'm not feeling good. And you immediately know what that, what that means. And we use it all the time. And, and when I think about back to the great coaches, you know, they're storytellers, They're brilliant. They use analogies and metaphors like a surgeon uses a scalpel. And they always have the right words for the moment to pick you up, to to bring your ego back down to earth, or to give you that cue you need to learn that movement you've been struggling with. So for me, I feel that analogies and metaphors are a very specific type of of external focus. And we call them an external focus because they're not internal. So they, they kind of fall into that category. And they're just a great way to transcend information from me to someone else. So what I challenged myself to do, and it was a similar challenge as what I did with What We Say Matters, was to really look at analogies. And I knew I could not stand up there for an hour and say, give more analogies, thank you, goodbye. But rather thoughtfully look at, you know, how does what they call analogical reasoning, how does it emerge in kids? right? Why is it important? How do we use it in everyday conversation? And what I wanted to do was shine the light on how prevalent the use of analogy and metaphor is. Getting down to to the concept that analogy actually might even be the core of all thinking and the core of all human cognition. Because if, if you think about it, it's very difficult to understand something new unless you first understand it in the context of something you have experience with. And you constantly rationalize new information through the lens of something you already know and just reflect on thinking and conversation and you'll quickly find this. So I take individuals kind of through this process, but inevitably I get to what I feel are principles, a very practical recommendation because, you know, again, the the thing I don't like about the term art of coaching, even though we used it to label our portion of the podcast, was that oftentimes art is a term we use when there isn't necessarily science to support it. And I think there is tremendous science to support this thing that we call an art. And my goal is to help younger coaches, right, or just coaches in general, understand the principles behind effective coaching. And within this presentation, I talk about things called structure mapping. And this is not from me. It's, it's from the sciences that look, psycholinguistics that looks at analogy. And they talk about the four effective principles of an effective or impactful analogy. And thus, for an analogy to make sense, and thus for it to be useful in taking something you know, familiar and attaching it to the unfamiliar, there has to be four qualities. And that is one, you have to be using an analogy that presents a scenario and uses language that the the receiver is familiar with. If you give an analogy, if you use language that they've had no experience with, analogy is null and void. Uh, Second, there has to be similarities between the analogy and the point you're trying to convey. So for example, about sprinting, if I was to tell you to sprint off the line like a helicopter, that wouldn't make sense because I'm encouraging you to pop straight up. Conversely, if I told you to sprint off the line like a jet taking off an aircraft carrier, well, that would make a lot of sense because I'm trying to get to a long position, moving forward, generating a lot of horizontal force as fast as possible. So there has to be appropriate similarities. But then these next two points go together. You have to tell a story And that story has to be emotionally intriguing to the person. So if you use familiar language that captures the right similarities around what they know and what you're trying to teach them, and you use what I call their personal narrative, you use language and stories that are relevant to them and emotionally intriguing, you have an amazing way to communicate a message. Now, the ways that I talk about doing that are making sure that you have the Inventory, you need the raw materials that analogies are made up of. And the raw materials 
from anal for analogies come from the client or the athlete's personal experience. It's a complete guess if you try to use an analogy and know nothing about the person. And we all know this because we've given the cue, the metaphor, the analogy, and gotten the blank stare back from the client who just did not get it. And I, I give an anecdote about that during this section. But basically, I, I say there's, there's five major areas that you need to, to be an expert on in terms of your clients. And that is, what's their culture? And you better believe, moving to Ireland, when I'm out coaching Rena, and I'm giving cues that I know work with American football players from the West, uh, I'm getting blank stares on some of them. So I'm dealing with this right now in its amazing process because you know, they call the trunk of a car a boot, right? They call fries chips. They're all these things that I might pull into my coaching narrative might mean nothing to them or mean something completely opposite. So know the culture, know the generation, right? When did they grow up? If I'm dealing with a younger athlete, using technology, using analogies that reference technology, you know, are important. Someone that's older, I might say, well, the hay's not in the barn. Someone that's younger, I might say, the app's not done downloading on the, fo on the phone. Either way, it's meant to mean the work's not done. We gotta keep going. From there, understanding their motivation, what's behind them, what's their why, what's their it. Their, ha their habits and hobbies, I feel is a big one. Get to know what they like to do when they're not doing what they do with you, right? Do they, you know, if they're a football player, what do they enjoy if they couldn't play football, right? What would be their profession, right? What would be their, their superpower? What is their favorite superhero if they have one? What's their favorite color? And maybe if you know their favorite color, you use that color cone. All these little bits allow you to start arc architecting an experience that is personalized to them. And again, I'll, I'll say it, it's about involving the client or the athlete's personal narrative in your coaching narrative in terms of how you communicate with them. And then the final bit I will share for, for everyone is then I provide another level of structure that is specific to our field of strength and conditioning or coaching. And thus analogies that are likely most effective, again, taking something from Familiar to teach the unfamiliar, they need to have another four attributes. They need to reference ideally the time or the speed that the movement's trying to encourage, the direction, the distance, or the space the movement is encouraging, like a sprint, for example, uh, the geometry or the shape of the body, and then finally the force or the strength that is, is being encouraged. So again, we talk about a jet being a very good analogy for a sprint because you're trying to do it fast. You're going straight ahead. The shape of the body is long, strong, right, lean, and you're trying to generate a lot of force. Similar analogy might be making the relationship of a rocket or even a, a helicopter to a vertical jump, something that's vertically oriented, that's fast, that's powerful, and trying to achieve a long body position. But again, if I'm utilizing those analogies, they might structurally map quite nicely to the movement, but if they're not familiar, right? If they're not relevant, then they're, they're going to be null and void again. So what I try to do is give people very simple, tangible principles. Therefore, it can bring some logic and some insight behind their analogies, behind their cues. Again, my goal is that the same way we put thought to reps and sets and periodization, I want just a little bit of noticing, right? It doesn't have to be too specific, we don't have to write it all down, but a little bit of noticing, a little bit of reflection, a little bit of thought going into the communication we use because we have such brief moments to interact and to engage and modify and upgrade the athletes and clients around us. I wanna make sure that we're maximizing the tool we use more than any other, and that's, that's our words. Awesome, wow, yeah, you're right. We named that uh, segment wrong. It should have been the science, the art, and the systems of coaching. So if we do it again, <laughs> if we do it again, we will get that. So Nick, looking forward to that lecture, number one. Um, and thanks so much. Congratulations on your PhD. Congratulations on your new gig. And uh, and it's so great to hear your voice and have you back on the Strength Coach Podcast. So uh, thanks for taking an hour out of your day and uh, and coming and joining us. Thank you so much. You got a long day of work ahead of you, and I'm going to go home and see my beautiful family. So, <laughs> all right. I appreciate I appreciate everything you do, Rena. Again, I'm here. You hear it all the time, but what you do for this industry is invaluable. So, thank you. 
All right, well, that's going to do for episode 184 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Pryor, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars, including the start of the summit season. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Nick Winkleman for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement. Rachel Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Brett Jones and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. Jim Kilbasso and the Complete Speed and Power Summit. Check them out at speedandpowersummit.com. They only have a few spots left. It's coming up in May in Indianapolis. Audible.com. They are giving away Shrink Coach Podcast listeners a special offer to download your free audiobook. Today, go to freebookfromant.com. Again, that's freebookfromant.com. Dot com for your free audiobook. And of course, remember you can join shrinkcoach.com and have access to the site for just $1, three days, just a buck. Once your three day trial is over and you become a member, you'll be able to download Coach Boyle's two books, Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities, as well as Advances in Functional Training. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off, depending on how many people you got. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com, click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name is Anthony Rand, and you can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.